All right, let's go over problem of the day 22. This was our first problem of the day on chapter 8 chemistry. And question number one was asking you to identify carbons containing beta protons. So what is a beta position on a molecule? All right, so I heard somebody say it's the second carbon away from your leaving group, right? So if we look at this carbon where the bromine's attached, would that be alpha or beta? Alpha. alpha, so that's not a beta carbon at all. But we do have two beta carbons. We've got a beta carbon here, and we've got a beta carbon here. So, which one of these carbons has protons coming off of it? The one on the right. If you notice, the one on the left is only bonded to carbons. It doesn't have any hydrogens coming off of it. So in the first molecule, we only have beta protons right there. What about the second molecule? We've got two different beta carbons, one on the left, one on the right. Which one of those carbons has beta protons? The left, okay. The one on the right is only bonded to carbons. It doesn't have any beta protons available. Look at the last one. We've got a beta position here and a beta position here. Which one has beta protons or do they both? They both do. So we could label both of these as being carbons that contain beta protons. We always have to double check because occasionally students get confused and they say, well, what about this one? Isn't there a proton there? No, we have to remember with bond line structure, there can't be a proton there without forming a Texas carbon. So it's not allowed. All right, let's do the mechanism. A lot of people we're thrown by this because they said it's too easy. That's a good thing, right? <laughs> What's the first step in an E1 mechanism? Leaving group falls off, okay. Just like with an SN1 reaction, the leaving group falling off is going to be your rate limiting step. So would we prefer to run this in a polar protic solvent or an aprotic solvent? Polar protic. So polar protic solvents would stabilize that leaving group falling off we'd go to our carbocation intermediate. Which has a positive charge there. Is that a primary, secondary, or tertiary carbocation? Secondary. secondary. In class, I said that secondary carbocations aren't as stable as tertiary. But this one's actually more stable than a tertiary carbocation. Why is that? Resonance. So in this case, it's a benzylic carbocation. It's incredibly stable because that positive charge can delocalize around the ring. All right. Now, the next step. We've got potassium terbutoxide, which is an ion pair. We need to identify beta protons for the elimination. So if we go back up to problem one, we said there were only beta protons to the right, not to the left. So we can draw those in and we can say, all right, there's two beta protons right here and here. That means we need to deprotonate one of them. Let me draw in beta too. So this will come grab a beta proton, the lone pair, or sorry, the bonding set of electrons will clamp down and we'll get our alkene. And we also have our conjugate acid, which is tert-butanol and potassium bromide. But I have a question for you guys. Why didn't I show the cis alkene as a product? Yeah, trans alkenes are more stable than a cis alkene. The reality is with this reaction, you would actually get a mixture of products. Some would be cis, but this would be your minor product. And we said it was going to be your minor product because you actually run into this steric clash between that methyl group hanging off and that phenyl group hanging off. So just like we said, a methyl group spins around like a helicopter blade. It doesn't want to be near other bulky groups at all. So in this case, we um, primarily observe the trans product. Does that make sense? All right. Let's continue on with chapter eight, but let's briefly review what we covered yesterday. So yesterday I said there are two main methods for elimination. Method number one involves a base grabbing the beta proton directly. It clamps down and kicks off your leaving group. 
We said that this happens concerted, just like with an SN2 reaction, and we get our alkene and our conjugate acid. We said that it's E2 because it's second order. And then with method two, we said it's similar to an SN1 in that your leaving group falls off first, then your base grabs your beta proton, clamps down, and gives you your alkene. The same rules apply. So with method two, do you think a primary, secondary, or tertiary carbon is going to be most reactive? Or for this method two? Tertiary. We need to form a stable carbocation. With the E2 mechanism, it can occur at a primary carbon or a secondary carbon, but you don't often see it with tertiary. All right, so let's continue on and compare substitution to elimination. This is one tricky part of this chapter, is if we look at these, they look really similar. So let's look at E2 again. Let's say I've got bromine here, and I've got a really good base. I'm going to just draw this as generic B minus. What would our product look like? I'll give you guys a second to predict the product here. Will the leaving group fall off first? No. What happens with an E2? Yeah, we need to identify our beta protons so we can say, all right, this is our alpha position. This is our beta position. We actually have two beta positions. It doesn't really matter which one we use because they're equivalent. So we want to show our base attacking this beta proton. And are we done? No, we've got to have this clamp down like dominoes and eject off our bromine. All right, so now we end up with this new alkene plus our base that's protonated, so it's now a conjugate acid, plus we end up with our leaving group that fell off, so that was Br, or bromide. Let's compare this to Sn2. I'm going to use the same starting material. This time I'm going to use a generic nucleophile that's strong. And if it's, this is an SN2 reaction, do I want to use polar protic or polar aprotic solvents? Aprotic. Why do we want to use aprotic solvents? What was that? Yeah, so they, they don't stabilize the nucleophile. In this case, a polar aprotic solvent, because it doesn't stabilize the nucleophile, will actually destabilize it and allow this to occur very readily. So with an SN2 reaction, we're going to have it do this backside attack and then kick off our bromine. So now we end up with our inverted product, but it doesn't really matter because it's achiral. And we end up with our bromine that's negative. Yep? So the difference is that in elimination you have to attack a hydrogen, while in SN2 reaction you have to attack Yes, that's correct. So in an elimination, your base will attack your beta proton, deprotonate it, clamp down and form an alkene, whereas with an SN2 reaction, your nucleophile is attacking a carbon directly. Yeah, that's a good question. So let's kind of note the differences here, because they're really similar. In each case, we're starting with the same substrate. But one's using a base, one's using a nucleophile. Oftentimes, good bases are good nucleophiles. It can be really hard to predict whether or not an elimination reaction will occur or a substitution reaction will occur. So let's point out some differences. So key differences. If we want to do an E2 reaction, what's the obvious thing that we need? A base. So E2 elimination, we have to have a really strong base. If we want to do SN2, we need a really strong nucleophile. So key difference is SN2 requires strong nucleophile. E2 requires a strong base.
Oftentimes, a strong base is a strong nucleophile, but we're going to cover this more. There are some situations where you can have something that is only a strong base and it is not nucleophilic at all. Um, what's something else we notice about the reaction in terms of entropy? Which one's becoming more disordered, E2 or SN2? E2. E2. So let's label that. We'll say more disordered. Does high temperature or low temperature favor more disorder? High temperature. So when we apply heat to things, that favors them being more disordered. So if we want to do an E2 reaction, should we run it hot or cold? Hot. So elimination reactions, for the most part, are typically run under really hot conditions in order to favor the uh, increase in entropy that we're observing. So elimination reactions are favored at high temps. Which makes sense, because if you think about the cyclohexanol lab that we did this last week, we were running that hot, right? We wanted to favor the elimination process because we wanted the system to become more disordered. So we were trying to drive it entropically. All right, so now what we've got to do is we've got to go back to this point of comparing our nucleophiles to our bases. So let's create a new topic here, nucleophilicity versus basicity. So nucleophile strength, oh, is related to what? If we're thinking about an energy a reaction coordinate diagram, is it related to activation energy, Gibbs free energy, enthalpy, entropy? What are we looking at? I heard somebody say it super quietly in the back. Activation energy. So nucleophile strength, we're looking at activation energy with base strength. We're not looking at activation energy. Instead, we're looking at change in Gibbs free energy, so that delta G. And so let's make a reaction coordinate diagram and show this graphically. We've got Gibbs free energy on our y-axis. We've got reaction progress on our x-axis. We're going from starting material to products. It's a one-step reaction, so we're going through some sort of transition state. And if we think about this, we can say, all right, we'll draw out this pretend dotted line going across. Activation energy is describing this energetic hump that you have to overcome, right? How big is the hill that you have to climb? How much energy do you need to overcome um, the reaction barrier? Delta G instead is looking at how much more stable your products are than your reactants. It doesn't care about the transition state, it's just saying, I want to look at your products, I want to look at your reactants and compare their stability. So base strength is only looking at starting materials products, we're not comparing how we got there. Nucleophile strength is we're actually looking at that hump we have to overcome. So let's come up with some factors that affect activation energy. So factors that affect activation energy, and this is related to nucleophilicity. What was one trick we used with SN2 reactions to make something more nucleophilic? Anybody have an idea? Solvent. So solvent plays a huge role in the activation energy. So let's put down solvation. The first thing we're looking to do is we want to stabilize our transition state. So I'll call this transition state TS double dagger. And if we think about the transition state, 
we're essentially trying to drop this portion of the graph down so we can say, well, if we drop this down to here and lower that energetic hump we have to overcome, it's going to require a lower activation energy. Do we want a polar protic solvent or a polar a or a nonpolar solvent if we're looking to stabilize the transition state? Polar or nonpolar? Just compare those two. Polar, right? The transition state that we're going through is a polarized transition state, which means a polar solvent is going to stabilize it more. So we definitely want a polar solvent. And then we've got the other half we want to look at, which is we can also lower activation energy by destabilizing our starting material. So if we want to make something more nucleophilic, do we want polar protic or polar aprotic? Polar aprotic. So we'll add that in. So in general, when we're trying to do a substitution reaction, we want to use the appropriate solvent. If we're doing SN2, we want it to be polar aprotic. If we're doing SN1, we want it to be polar protic. So let's talk a little bit about nucleophile strength. I wanted to review that. And because we're organic chemists, we only deal with our small corner of the periodic table. We've got carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. Going down, we've got chlorine, bromine, iodine. Below oxygen, we've got sulfur and selenium. And below nitrogen, we have phosphorus. All right, let's compare going up and down a column. Let's say I want fluoride to be most nucleophilic. What sort of solvent should I use? Aprotic, right? So fluoride is more unstable or nucleophilic in aprotic solvents. In this case, we can rationalize this by saying none of, none of these halogens are going to be that solvated in an aprotic solvent. Fluorine's the least stable among them, so it's going to be the most nucleophilic. Right? So this is really due to a lack of solvation. All right. Let's say during a separate reaction, I want iodide to be my nucleophile. I want to make it the most nucleophilic halogen. What sort of solvent would I prefer in this case? Protic. So we can switch these too if we want to invert the trends. So we can say this is most or more unstable. Or nucleophilic and protic solvents. And this is because it is less tightly solvated. So now let's go up and amend this a little bit. We want polar aprotic with SN1 or SN2? SN2. So we'll add that in. And then we want polar protic. for SN1. Occasionally you see it with SN2 if you're looking to install something like iodide, but normally we see polar aprotic solvents used in an SN2 reaction instead of polar protic. Does that make sense? We've got the two lines of attack. Destabilize our starting material, stabilize our transition state. That lowers the hump that you have to overcome. What's something else that can affect nucleophilicity? Does anybody remember the other thing I briefly mentioned when we were covering nucleophiles? Yeah. I heard a good analogy the other day. Imagine that you're trying to hire a goaltender for a hockey match. Do you want a little skinny, tiny person? Or do you want the giant, like, six foot eight guy? Yeah, because if it's really, really bulky, that's going to prevent a nucleophilic attack. 
simply because there's too much space being occupied by the goalie himself or herself. So let's add this on. This has entirely, or this has to do with sterics. Sterics is just a fancy word for bulkiness. Whoop. So let's compare our electrophile. Do we want a bulky electrophile or a non-bulky electrophile for a substitution reaction that's SN2, for example? Yeah, so electrophile for SN2 should not be bulky. Or hindered. For our nucleophile, the same thing holds true. We want an unhindered nucleophile. So let's compare two of these. The first nucleophile I have is OCH3, the oxygen's got a negative charge. Second one I have has three methyl groups coming off of it. Which one's going to be more nucleophilic, the one on the left or the right? Left, simply because of its size, right? So in this case, this would be more nucleophilic simply because it's less bulky. All right, so we've gone through and we've identified the two features that affect nucleophile strength, solvation and sterics. With basicity, we're not concerned with these two things as much. So let's go through and address what affects basicity. So factors. that affect delta G, which we said has to do with basicity. We said when we look at the reaction coordinate diagram, all we want to do is to maximize that difference in energy between our starting materials and our products, right? So there are two different things we could do. We could use really, really unstable starting materials or we could use really, really stable products. We want to increase that gap as much as possible. So let's even write that down. We want to want to have unstable starting materials. And we want to have stable products. So if we think about it, would we want a s stable or unstable base for the first step for our starting material? Unstable. unstable. So basically all this is saying is we want to use an unstable base or a reactive base. And this second part is basically saying that we want a stable conjugate base. We're not going to spend a lot of time covering this because we already covered this in chapter three, how to analyze the stability of our starting acids or base and the stability of our conjugate base or conjugate acid. But review chapter three if you're rusty. I know some people are a little rusty. But we need to use the same concepts that we covered in chapter three in this chapter. 
Another thing that I mentioned was that sterics and solvation only play a small role. Acid-base chemistry is going to be the quickest chemistry. That implies that it has a relatively small activation energy, assuming we're using a strong base. We're not really concerned with the activation energy, only that difference. Yeah? Are you sure you need stable conjugate base? Maybe not. Can't acid? Uh, in this case, you don't want the reaction to go in the reverse direction. So you'd want both a stable conjugate base and a stable conjugate acid. Uh, basically, you want the entire product side to be more stable than the starting material side. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Yep, so you could look at it in terms of either your acid or your base. Normally, I like looking at the stability of your conjugate base um, just because it's pretty easy to compare those given the trends we learned. But the main point is just that you, what you start with is unstable and what you end with is... Exactly, that's the main point. The main point is we want to start with really unstable starting materials and go to really stable products. We don't care how we get there. Yep. Is one weighted better than the other? Like how, if you're getting really two really similar cases, how do you tell? Um, we just have to look at it in the context of the reaction in order to predict the stability. Just like we did with acids and bases in chapter three, it's all relative to your acid-base pairing. You could have a really, really strong acid and a really, really weak base, and so have the reaction go forward. So we have to look at both sides of the, of the problem. All right, so now we get into the tricky question. What if we want a strong, or a strong base that's not also a strong nucleophile? So let's dig into this a little bit. So what if we want a strong non-nucleophilic base? When we're doing elimination reactions, we don't care about nucleophile strength. All we want is a base. In fact, we don't want it to be nucleophilic because that will give you a competing reaction. So we've got a couple of options. Option number one, what might we use to our advantage if we want something to be a good base but not be a good nucleophile? Oh, I heard them both at the same time. So we'll start with uh, sterics first. So use a super bulky base. A super bulky base is too big to be a good nucleophile. But it's fine just plucking off a proton off of an adjacent molecule, right? The proton's located on the exterior. It doesn't have to attack all the way into a deep uh, buried carbon. So a common base you might see me use is this one. This is nice and bulky. It's got three different ethyl groups hanging off of it. It's not going to be a good nucleophile. But this oxygen is relatively basic and it will grab a proton. Just like we saw in our problem of the day with potassium terputoxide, that was a good base, but we didn't see the substitution reaction. All right, now we're gonna get into our exotic ones. So be patient with me, these are not easy to draw. All right, you guys ready for the name for this one? It's a mouthful. 1,5-diaza bicyclo. What should our bridge heads be? What do you guys think? We've got to count the path length, so let's find our longest one. We've got one, two, three, four as one bridge length, and then if we go this side, we've got one, two, three, so it should be four, three, zero. zero. So we've got one, five, diase of bicyclo, four, three, zero, known five-ene. 
Say that 10 times fast. Instead of saying this, chemists oftentimes refer to it as its acronym, and they just refer to this as DBN. It saves us a lot of time. <laughs> so we just say DBN for the nonine derivative. And why is this a particularly good base? So I'm going to actually copy this down here, and we're going to look at the acid-base reactivity of this. Oh, come on. Paste. There we go. So which nitrogen do you think is going to be the basic site? So I've got my generic proton. Yeah, so this set of lone pairs down on the bottom can grab that proton. And when it does this, we end up with a new structure. Where this nitrogen has got a positive charge. And why is this so stable? Yeah, resonance. So we can draw this and we can say we get a resonance stabilized conjugate acid, and that lone pair that we used is not super accessible. It's buried in this large bicyclic ring system. So we end up with a resonance stabilized conjugate acid. Same thing is true with the next one I'm about to show you, but it's even bulkier. So we use DBN a lot, but we also use its cousin. Yeah, that's a scientific term. Chemical cousin. Got this larger ring system coming off. Shoot. There we go. And the name for this one is 1,8 diaza bicyclo. And what should our bridge lengths be for this one? It should be 540, right? Because if we go over this path, we go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. The other path is 4. So 5. Four zero un deck. Come on, un deck seven in. So that's a mouthful. Using the same acronym system that we used before, what do you think we call this one? DBU. It's a lot easier than saying, saying 1,8 diaza bicyclo, 540, undec 17. So DBU. Same thing applies with this one. If we look at this lone pair down on the bottom here, that lone pair, if it gets protonated, is going to form a resonance stabilized conjugate acid, right? That makes these really good bases, but they're never going to act as a nucleophile. They're just simply too big. Yep. That's a good question. So aza refers to the position of the nitrogens. So um, we're going to talk more about nitrogen nomenclature when we get to that chapter. But that's more second and third term. But that's a good question. Can you explain what the A stands for? 1A. Uh, the which part? Oh, the 1A. That's referring to the position of the nitrogens. So just really quickly, we could number this. Go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, Eight, we've got nitrogens at the one and eight position. Why we don't go around the clockwise direction? You always want to go around your longest possible bridge length. Okay. Yeah. I'm not going to throw complicated naming like this at you guys on the exam, but I do want you to know how to name basic bicyclic alkanes. What's that? Un. So un deck simply refers to we've got eight, nine, ten, eleven. 
uh, membered ring, so we call it an undecene. Yeah. Yep. All right, so we said option one was use a super bulky base, which works really well. This is a common solution to our, a lot of our problems. But we also have option two. What was the other thing that we could use to our advantage? Solvents. Particularly, let's pick a base that isn't soluble. Therefore, it can't be a nucleophile. A nucleophile has to be soluble. That's a good question. So the question was, how can a base work if it's not dissolved? Acid-base chemistry is unique. It can happen at interfaces, at a surface. It doesn't actually have to be in the bulk solution to occur. The reason for that is if you think about protons, they're on the exterior of a molecule. It's easy to pluck off a proton. It's much, much harder for a nucleophile to go in and attack a carbon that's deep inside a molecule. So in this case, acid-base chemistry is really fast because those protons are super accessible. The reagent that chemists like to use is sodium hydride. Did you just write pick A, A, B? Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'll slide this over. So pick a base that is not soluble, therefore it can't be a nucleophile. We like to use sodium hydride. And... If you remember, sodium hydride is Na+, plus, and then what's going on with the hydrogen? Yeah, it's not a proton, it's H lone pair negative. So this is an ionic compound. My old advisor in grad school used to call this stuff brick dust. Because it will not go into solution. You can try and try and try, but sodium hydride just sits there on the bottom of your flask as a powder. It won't dissolve, but it does acid-base chemistry. How will we know if this reaction has occurred? Yeah, hydrogen gas. So the reaction occurs at the interface of the solid. and produces H2 gas. So you put it in and you'll actually see it fizzing, almost like an Alka-Seltzer tab on the bottom of your reaction. Uh, one problem with using this in the practical sense is if you've got sodium hydride and you live in a climate like Washington or Oregon where it rains a lot and it's really humid, it will actually react with the moisture of the air or in the air and produce hydrogen gas in your closed container. So not only will they deliver this in a loosely lidded container, but by doing that, you allow more water to come in. And so this reagent actually has a pretty short shelf life and you have to double check to make sure that your reagent's still good before you actually use it. All right, does that make sense? These are our main lines of attack for only getting acid or base chemistry to occur. No substitution occurs with these reagents. Now what we're going to do is we're going to change gears and talk in more detail about the E2 mechanism. Oh. Okay. So what was one feature of the E2 mechanism? How do we know that it was an E2 and not an E1? Concerted, I heard somebody say first order. So it's a concerted first order reaction. Or sorry, oh man, thank you. <laughs> Second order reaction. So if we think about the rate, sorry guys, I've messed up there. Our rate is going to be equal to our small k times the concentration of our substrate. 
times the concentration of our base. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <coughs> Concerted second order reaction. That was my fault. The rate is due to both the concentration of your substrate and base. It requires them both colliding or reacting with one another in order for the reaction to proceed. The other thing that is really important for this reaction that we haven't talked about yet is that our beta proton must be anticoplanar. To the leaving group. So do you guys remember anticoplanar from Newman projections? So let's review this. I've got a carbon-carbon bond here. If we look at it, I've got the green stick in the back, the yellow stick in the front. You're looking down this bond. Are they anticoplanar right now? No, they're not at all. What does anticoplanar mean? It's got to be staggered, and specifically, it's got to be staggered so that our leaving group is pointed up and our anticoplanar proton is pointed down. They have to be perfectly aligned with one another in order for this reaction to occur. So you do have to make sure that your molecule is oriented correctly. And so what I recommend doing is draw your Newman projection. How can you rotate a Newman projection? Because um, you want it to be an empty coplanar, isn't it? Yeah, so let's take a look at an example of this, and then we'll, okay. we'll see it in action. Did you have a question? So there's only one hydrogen, but the base is done. Well, let's see this in context of an example. OK, so a trick. Draw your Newman projection. The first example problem I have for you guys is with just a generic leaving group. I'm going to call this LG. And then over here, we've got a hydrogen. And then let's color code our hydrogens coming off. So I'm going to label this one green. I'm going to label this one red. And I'm going to label this one blue. Let's imagine drawing the Newman projection where we are looking down this carbon-carbon bond. I want you guys to help me draw this. Newman projection. So what should be sticking straight up? Hydrogen. The what color hydrogen? Black ones up. Okay, we've got two things going left and right. What goes to the bottom right? The green or the red hydrogen? Green. Ah, oh, there's disagreement. So let's imagine we're looking down this bond, the green hydrogen sticking into the board. So if we rotate it back out, the green hydrogen should be to your right. The red hydrogen should be to your left. Then we look at our back carbon. We've got three different groups coming off, two off the top. What goes off the top right? Yeah, the blue hydrogen, so we'll fill that in. And then if we look going down, we've got this R group, and that leaves us with our leaving group over here. So which proton in this conformation is anticoplanar? Green. So we can go ahead and circle this, and we could say this is anticoplanar. What's that? So let's draw a reaction and do the full mechanism now. Oop, let's keep the same color scheme going. So I've got the blue hydrogen here, red hydrogen down here, green hydrogen here. And if we have this react with the base, we said it has to go after the anticoplanar proton, 
the one that's facing the opposite direction. So if we draw the full mechanism, it's going to attack here, clamp down, and kick off our leaving group. So now our blue hydrogen is left. And then we've got our green hydrogen over here. Or sorry, we took the green hydrogen, our black hydrogen, be here, and our red hydrogen would be here. Plus our conjugate acid, plus our leaving group that fell off. Are we limited to only, sorry, I'll come back to you. Are we limited to only selecting that green proton? Uh, we could rotate it and actually select any of those protons, and they could be in the anticoplanar position, but that doesn't negate the fact that that proton we select must be anticoplanar when the reaction occurs, right? Yep? No offense to this question, but like you were saying, it has to be anticoplanar, so even if we can, does it really matter, or does this become a thing that people do in the future in chemistry? No, it... Yeah, that's a good question. So the question was, does, why does it matter, especially in this case when it can spin around and any of the protons can be anticoplanar? It does matter when you're looking at the stereochemistry of the molecule, and we're going to get into that next. So the stereochemistry plays a huge role in this. So let's take a look at a more challenging problem. So again, I'm going to pick a bromine, got a hydrogen here, actually let me do a hydrogen here, I'll do a phenyl group, and then I'll do an ethyl group. Actually, sorry, let me change this phenyl to a methyl. I want to be consistent with an E2 mechanism. All right, so let's draw the Newman projection. Let's assume we are looking the same direction as we were before. What should be sticking straight up? Hydrogen. What should be sticking to the bottom right? Ethyl. Ethyl, and then that leaves methyl to the bottom left. Okay. And then in the top right, we have hydrogen. And then we've got bromine over here. And then we've got our methyl group here. Do we have an anticoplanar beta proton? Yeah. Oh. If we look. <laughs> Oops, shoot. If we look, this is our leaving group. But over here, there's no proton. We've got an ethyl group there we have to have a proton that's anticoplanar. How can we resolve this? Ah, rotate it. So in order for this reaction to occur, let's hold that back carbon static. We're gonna move the front carbon around. So I'm gonna take this hydrogen, rotate it over here, this ethyl group, rotate it over here, and this methyl group, I'll rotate it over here. So now this hydrogen is sticking here, we've got a methyl group sticking up, and we've got an ethyl group over here. So now if we look at it, these are anti-coplanar. So that means in our final product, our alkene, these will be cis. to each other. And then these two will be cis. All right, I think that's where we're going to leave off today. But tomorrow, when we come back, we're going to talk a lot more about the stereochemistry and the regiochemistry in these reactions in even more detail. 
Not to scare you guys, but there's more involved here <laughs> than what I'm showing you. 